I started thinking about what, what were the things that uh, helped me walk through my post-traumatic stress. Now, I, I was never diagnosed with PTSD. I just didn't feel like I wanted to go through the whole VA system. If you know anything about that system, sometimes it can be uh, arduous. And uh, so I just, I thought, well, I, I can get through it myself. But the thing is, is I couldn't. Uh, my wife did these five things and I kind of put words to them. She loved me. Uh, even sometimes if I didn't deserve it, <laughs> she, she listened to me. And, you know, and I talk about in the book, what I call aerobic listening. Uh, she learned where my trauma came from. Um, and then what she did, she did practical steps to lessen further trauma happening to me. And then she led me in the way that she knew how to lead me. And, and so all of those things happened for me. And now in my life, uh, Wes, that's really how I try to lead the people in my life. You know, always looking in my sphere of influence through the lens of love and through this trauma-informed lens. Um, and if you don't know much about the trauma-informed movement, uh, it's really about changing the conversation from what's wrong with that person to what happened to that person. You know, and I think if we can all view the people that we work with, the people that we lead through a lens like that, then it's, it's just better for society in general um, because it's, it's compassionate, it's empathetic. And if I can do that in my sphere and you can do it in your sphere and our spheres connect, we make our community better. So yeah, I think it's kind of like that. And to be clear, the person that you're helping does not they don't have necessarily have had a, 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 a traumatic event in your life, in their life, like they might have experienced in combat, right? We're talking about lessons that can be applied every day. Yeah. Well, think, think about the person that works with you that's late for work. Okay. Uh, I like to use this example. So let's say I'm a, I'm a single mom. I've got three kids and they're all school aged. I, I have to work at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, I live in the Phoenix Valley. I wake up. Uh, two of my kids can't find their shoes, right? And so I'm spending all this time, they're trying to find their shoes and we can't find them. And then I'm already behind now and I'm trying to get them breakfast and I'm getting their lunches packed for school. And then I finally get out uh, out in the car and I pull out and I got a flat tire. And so then I got to call somebody to come over, help me change it. And then I get it changed or maybe I change it myself. And, and then I'm driving down the road, four people cut me off. They're honking their horns at me. And all along, all of these things are happening to me and I, I show up to work and you know what, I'm late. I'm, I'm 40 minutes late because of everything that happened to me. If, if my supervisor walks up to me and said, what is wrong with you? Instead of what happened to you? See how that changes the whole conversation? Because, because if you say that, what, what happened to you this morning, Sean? And then I can say, let me tell you, the morning I've had, it's not accusatory. It's not, it's not angry. It's actually, it's coming to you with compassion. And I think so often, if we could look through a trauma-informed lens, uh, we'd have a lot better thing going on in the places that we work. So, yeah. So you've already mentioned that um, you have a position at Pat Tillman Center. So let's just back up just a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, so in your book, you tell the story early on, I think in the introduction about how you came to be in your position at the Tillman Center. If you wouldn't mind, can you please share your story um, about how that happened and how it informed the work that you do at ASU today? Mm, sure. So uh, my wife and I, we moved from Nebraska. Uh, we were campus pastors in Nebraska for an organization called Chi Alpha. And um, we retired. I retired from the Army National Guard after 21 years retired from that position as a campus pastor there and decided we were going to, what it, was it, LeBron James says, take our talents to South Beach. We were taking our talents to uh, the, the Valley of the Sun and we decided we'd move here and we thought our love for international students was kind of what drew us here. We heard all about ASU and the number of international students that, that go to the university. And, and we just, we love to be uh, kind of parents to kids that are far away from home. It's kind of something we enjoy. In fact, we had a host daughter for about four years living with us from India when we moved here. And uh, so we moved here with the intention on kind of being uh, this home away from home for international students. And I show up and I'm walking around the MU. I'm, I'm pastoring part-time at a church 
and uh, and it's right off of campus at Tempe. And I show up looking for international students in the MU, and I and I walk by the the Pat Tillman Veterans Center, and I've I felt something tug at me that I should go in there, and I said, "No, nah, you're just being weak. You're you're trying to get with your own people. You'll feel comfortable there. That's not why you're here." A little bit later on in the day, here comes this this student walks up to me and he says, "Hey, are you a veteran?" And I said, "Well, yeah. Why?" He said, "Well, so am I. I just saw your backpack there." And thought maybe I could sit down and have lunch with you. And so we talked and and they were in the Navy. So I guess I got to give you props for that. <laughs> but so I'm talking with this student and was telling me a little bit about uh, how, you know, it was hard, the transition from the military and, and over. And I said, yeah, I understand that. And so great conversation. Um, the next day I came to campus and Wes, believe it or not, this happens again. Uh, I felt like I was supposed to go in there. I didn't go in there. And then another student veteran comes up and says, hey, are you a veteran? Sets down, we're talking in the same kind of conversation. This happened three days in a row, except for the third time I was getting ready to get on the ASU shuttle. And I see this student that I know is a veteran, you know, wearing a black backpack, ball cap, perfectly round <laughs> bill, the, the, the exact shades, you know, uh, we both wait for everybody to get on the shuttle, and then we're the last two on the shuttle, and we sit right across the aisle from each other. And I said, so are you a veteran? He says, yeah. Why do you ask? And I said, uh, I just, I could tell. We had a great conversation. So I figure, I said no three times to going into the Tillman Center. Three times a veteran was kind of put in my path, and I said, okay, I'll go in there. And sure enough, they were looking for a chaplain. And uh, so I volunteered my time. I was not a chaplain in the military. This was an after the army kind of experience for me. And uh, so, yeah, they were looking for a chaplain. I volunteered my time for about a year and a half doing that. And then, uh, you know, the rest is, they say, uh, history. But, you know, before, before I go any further, Wes, I think it's important for all of our listeners to know that there might be a chance that, that I share a story uh, or do a reading or something that that maybe could trigger something in you. And so this is my trigger warning to you. Uh, just know that those kinds of things in our conversation today, me and Wes, there might be, there might come a time that you feel triggered. And if that's the case, I, I don't want you to leave, um, but you can, you can uh, turn off the volume if you need to. We're here for you. Uh, there's gonna be actually people uh, on this call today that they'll talk to you if you need them to, all right? So just, quick trigger warning. So thanks, Wes. All right. Well, thanks for that. So going from that day where, or that time period where um, you, you, tur you refused it three times and then, then you went in and you became yeah. the chaplain thinking about that day, mm. thinking about today. I know you've, you've impacted ASU, but how has ASU changed you as a person? Mm. You know, really, gosh, Thank you for asking that question. I, I feel like now, I, you know, I just turned 50 uh, in April and, and I feel like right now I'm living probably my best life. And so much of that I give credit to ASU for. And why do I say that? Um, they've given me the opportunity. Uh, you know, I, I wrote and published this book and, and I've had the opportunity to share my story. Um, the Pat Tillman Veterans Center, a lot of people don't realize the, the, the love um, and empathy and compassion that the staff there have for veterans, including myself, right? Like I, I like to talk about uh, Michelle, Michelle Lepofsky. I think she might even be on here. Um, she, she's given me, even begrudgingly sometimes, it's a little back and forth inside joke we have, like this platform to succeed that I, I don't think I would have ever had anywhere else. And, and then ASU on top of it, you know, I got a, I got a written letter from the president of the university congratulating me on, on writing this book and the impact that, that I'm having on student veterans. Like this is an enterprise of about, you know, with staff, faculty, and, uh, and students, you know, you're in the neighborhood of around almost 200,000 when you start thinking about it. And for the, for the president of that organization to reach out to you, it's like a family. And then, uh, you know, just the, I guess, having the platform to, to just be myself, maybe for the first time in my life, um, I get to be Sean at ASU. And, and that's, 
I'll tell you what, I said I'm an ASU fan. There's a reason. It's it's not just because I love watching their sports and, and wearing their gear, but, you know, that they're, they're kind of part of my family now. So it just means a lot to me. Thanks, Wes. I kind of know what it's like to have a military family being in a close-knit group and then not having that when you get out of the military. And, yeah. and it, is, uh, it is reassuring <laughs> to find that in civilian life. So yeah, it, it really is. That definitely resonates uh, with me. So you've taken the office of St staff council president on July mm. 1st. Um, what do you think are the most important of the five L's that you bring to work with you? Uh, you know, I, I am getting ready tomorrow. We have our executive council retreat and I'm getting ready to kind of set forth my, my intent as the, as the president. And, and I'm telling you, I'm, I'm nervous. <laughs> it's a, it's a big deal. There's like 200 staff council members and all these vice presidents and committee members and, and all of these things. And to try to, to keep that uh, organized and do a good job. And I'm, I'm just really humbled by the fact that I was elected to it and, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, so I think that the three L's out of the five that I'm, I'm putting towards the staff council is to, to love, listen, and lead, you know, our, our mission in staff council and really mine as the, as the president moving for the next couple of years is will staff council love the people closest to them, right? So they're, they're people in their, in their group, in their department, on their teams, will they love them well? But then also will they love other people just wandering by? There's like 30,000 people working at ASU, staff members and stuff. And, and I'm just going to encourage them. You know, we're all kind of looking for that love and feeling, Wes, if I could. Like, it feels like the world is so right now, it's a scary place. And uh, I, I think uh, it's important. Everybody is searching for love in some way. Uh, humanity in its essence is searching for love. And if staff council can do that, I think we've won right there. And then to listen, people have a story. They want to tell their story. And if we do a good job listening, we'll, we're going to learn. Obviously, that's one of the L's. We're going to learn what's going on and, and then and to lead. You know, I, I talk about this in my book and I say it all the time. The greatest leaders I've ever known in combat or otherwise, they do one important thing. They do what I call bringing order to chaos. And if you think back yourself, uh, the leaders that you followed in the Navy, you knew when they walked in <laughs> that there was this peace or something that kind of came over the room. They had this aura or this, this sensibility to them. And, and I, I think staff council is in a perfect place as representatives of all staff to lead in that way, to, to kind of bring order to the chaos that... You know, ASU is a big, a, a big enterprise and it's kind of chaotic. And, and I hope that we can love and listen and lead. And those are the, kind of the three out of the five L's that we're, we're going to point to in the next couple of years. Um, in your book, you talk a lot about love and you give different, different definitions that, that people have of love and what society has of it. The, the uh, Christian um, tradition of agape. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk, I'm going to ask you a little bit more about listening in a minute, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about love, because that may seem strange. It, you know, at first blush, it seems a little strange to me. Um, how do we practice love, you know, in, in the workplace? What does that, what does that exactly mean? Yeah, no, it's, that's a good question. Uh, there, there's all these types of loves. And, uh, I think the, the, the love that, that kind of rings true on your day in and day out is phileo love. Uh, you, you know F Philadelphia is from phileo. Philadelphia is known as the, the city of brotherly love. And uh, what, if we, what if we spent our time consciously in a space of phileo love, that brotherly love? Like Wes, uh, you know, we both served in the military. So we have this connection now, this brotherly, like you're kind of a brother to me because uh, of what we shared together. Um, I think it's Camus. I think he was a French philosopher. Uh, he talked a little bit about uh, the focus of love as a kind of human solidarity. 
Um, not abstracting it. I think he said not abstract because love can kind of seem like this thing out here, like it, like this love you have for maybe a spouse or a child. It seems uh, it seems like it goes above and out of humanity a little bit that way. But but if we could see if we could see love really about uh, human solidarity, I think that's how we can practice it on a daily basis. Like what is good for me and what is good for you uh, is important. Um, I was listening to a podcast not long ago called On Being with Krista Tippett. And she made this, this remarkable statement that, boy, I, I can't forget it anymore. It's like the well-being of others is connected to my well-being. So if you're doing well, Wes, then guess what? I get the benefit of doing well. So to me, that's that's how we can practice love. And maybe that sounds selfish or egotistical, but I'm okay with that. If you're practicing love with me, like in this human solidarity feeling, just so you can feel better, good on you. Because I'm feeling good and you're feeling good all at the same time. So yeah, that's that's kind of how I see that. Okay. Well, as far as listening goes, there are parts of our society that traditionally have been rather invisible mm. and voiceless. People have not heard them. So can you discuss the importance of listening to those who traditionally have not had a voice? Mm. Yeah, that's like uh, your superpower. So everybody that's listening in, I didn't know if you know this, but your ability to listen is your superpower. Um, because if you will truly listen, like I discuss it in the book, this aerobic listening, so, so focused, you're going to learn something about people. Uh, you know, the same, the same philosopher, he said something like, uh, the evil that's in this world always comes from ignorance. And, and that's always struck me um, pretty significantly. Uh, if you don't listen to me, you're not going to know me. And therefore, you would probably fear me. Uh, Wes, do, do I look like a pretty kind guy to you if you didn't know me? <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, let me tell you something. The first time I saw you um, on the shuttle, I thought, that is one tough dude. I'm not going to mess with him. <laughs> so, so you didn't know that I was all about love and stuff, did you? Not exactly. Not at that oh. point. Now I do. No, because <laughs> and now when I look at you, I see a different person. Right. And you, you read my book, right? Yes. So you heard my voice. And now you know Sean. You, you don't just know some cat on the shuttle that looks tough or mean uh, with tattoos and bald headed and kind of a little bit scary. But you, you actually heard my voice. And, and imagine how love could proliferate if we listened to the people that we didn't know. Um, you know, and I, I think that so often the, the cases that, that you know of systemic racism are they they have origins in that i'm not even going to take the time to listen to you you look different than me you talk different than me you come from a different place than me we just have this superpower if we really wanted to use it we could change the world by listening well um, and getting to know one another um, wes i haven't really got to listen to you much but i'm already <laughs> starting to like you and you share some practical steps uh, or guidance on how we can all become aerobic listeners. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, th I think, uh, you know, there's this, this command in the military, it's called stand at ease. So the preparatory command is to stand at, and then the command itself is ease. And, and that command, if you saw it performed on the parade field or in formation, uh, the hands go behind the back and, and you stand like this or it's parade rest or, or whatever those commands are. And to stand at ease is you have to keep your body erect and at attention basically, but you can move your head back and forth in a formation. Meaning if the person that's speaking is moving and walking, you can watch them. And I, I've always found that really brilliant because when you look at something, you're taking in more information than when you're not. We're very visual creatures. Uh, you know, you're, right now, Wes, you're watching my mouth as I talk so that you can hear the things, so you can, you can ask the questions that you might need to ask. 
we have this ability to to do it and i think it's practical enough to actually use our eyes to listen um i think it's also practical to uh if you want to listen really well and you know that if you're really hungry going into a situation that you <laughs> won't listen well have that snack bar before you go into that situation uh <laughs> i'm gonna there you go i'm gonna pick on michelle again since she's in the audience michelle uh she has a history of a very large uh stomach rumbling right so whenever she's hungry <laughs> i hear her you can hear her stomach growling in an office and and she knows that if she wants to pay attention and listen well that she has to eat before she goes into those situations gosh those seem so practical but i think we often we just we just dis, we dismiss them out of uh, urgency or we're just you know we're so busy i just got to get into this thing if you really want to listen well, use your eyes, use your ears, um, use your smell. You, do you know you there's there's so many senses in our nose that you know if if you know if you know that you listen better by having some aroma aroma in your room, put some in there. Uh, those are those are just practical things. I know it it seems kind of silly to even talk about, but gosh, what if we did them? We might be better listeners after all. So I think you have selected um, part of your book to read to us. So I have. go right ahead. Well, thanks, Wes. I appreciate it. Um, this comes from the lesson chapter and it's chapter four. Uh, I've read this several times for people. Uh, and if I get emotional in the midst of it, just know that I'm sorry. <laughs> it happens. Um, but, but yeah, it's page 86. It was hot out that day and the sun was beating down and the sounds of the crowd that surrounded me were both safe and yet unsettling. I sat watching people move to and fro, weaving in and out of conversation, all without a care in the world. We were all sitting around in our trusty lawn chairs, eating the traditional American cuisine of burgers and hot dogs with ice cold sodas in hand. The church had some patriotic banners flitting on the fence close by. I found it odd that everybody appeared unaware of the busy movement going on around them and all of the loud bangs that enveloped the air. The echoing cracks and booms seemed to roll off the crowd as if they weren't even heard. How can they do this? How is it they're not flinching and why aren't they looking around in every direction trying to figure out what's up? Perhaps, I thought, I just need to get away from this and hit the mobile latrine in the church parking lot. Yes, that will do. I will get my bearings there while ridding myself of a few of these sodas at the same time. It was Nebraska on July 4th, so it was particularly dense and humid heat wave. I was sweating bullets, and while standing in that porta john, I began feeling transported to Iraq. The sweltering heat, tight space, and familiar dank smell of the latrine emanating from below was a familiar experience downrange in Iraq. And since the bathroom is often a place of pause and reflection, in my mind, I began recalling all kinds of memories about this and that, but especially about memories of wanting to be home and away from all the madness of war. And then, bang, pop, pop, pop. My body dropped to the floor and I stopped breathing and then began breathing rapidly. The heart inside my chest doubled its rate, pounding like a drum as fresh adrenaline coursed through my veins. My eyes flitted back and forth frantically and I instinctively reached for my weapon only to find that I did not have one. Where were the shots coming from and where's the nearest defense? How long should I stay here before running for out for better cover? My mind raced through a series of options in a matter of seconds that seemed like an eternity. I had, survived, I had to survive whatever this was. And then moments later, it hit me. I wasn't in Al Takedo. I wasn't hearing small arms fire. I wasn't even in danger. I was in my own church parking lot and Independence Day fireworks were being set off by kids from the youth ministry. Knowing this, however, obviously didn't prevent me from nearly mel melting down. My body was completely arrested. I was once again confronted with the fact that when the alarm bell of the emotional brain brings signal that you are in danger, no amount of insight will silence it. After pulling myself back together and taking a few controlled breaths, I walked out cautiously. I remained on high alert, even though I could see with my own eyes where I was and what was going on. 
it didn't matter. My brain and body had been trained over the course of 15 months to respond to perceived threats in a certain way. I walked across the lot and finally found Jody, my wife. She was sitting and talking to friends. She looked up and knew right away that something wasn't right. She stood up, for our, called for our kids, and politely excused us from the gathering. Let's go home, babe. In that moment, those were the most powerful words ever spoken to this broken soldier. It was as if the storm clouds had cleared in my mind. My heart rate began to stabilize and my breath returned to normal. I got in the car and we went home. And though that evening was not unicorns and rainbows because the fireworks burst on, I was able to at least find solace in my sanctuary called home. I survived the day. Wow. <clears throat> I have to say, and I'm sure other people who have read your book will realize it's an entirely different experience hearing you read that than me reading it myself. Hearing it in your own voice um, is uh, extremely powerful. So I hope, I think you said you were getting an audio version of this book out before too long. Yeah, I'm hoping that the, well, the library has already agreed to let me come and have some time in one of the labs. And yeah, I'm going to work on that hopefully this summer sometime. And I, I think it'll be very important. Um, and I, I do have a few more questions, but before I forget, while we're on the topic of the the, the, the book, the item, um, ASU Library does have a copy of it. It's a little out of focus here. Uh, Sean is getting some copies in. There we go. That's in focus. Sean is getting some copies into Phoenix Public Library. Yeah. And it is available on, on Amazon in both print and uh, electronic format. So you can also uh, you can also get it at Changing Hands Bookstore, both the Phoenix and the Tempe location too. So right. I didn't want to let that go by. Um, so thank you for that reading. That um, that's really something else. I mean, um, I think when I read it, I I was thinking more about the sound, just one aspect of the environment. But as you read it, you know, I'm I'm feeling the heat, the humidity. I'm smelling the the portage on, and all of that yeah. all of that played into what happened to you that day yeah it did it it all came together in like a perfect storm maybe yeah so in your chapter on learning uh which is you know one of the five l's mm -hmm. you say understanding can dispel fear for we fear what we don't understand i think you touched on that by the the philosopher can you ex elaborate for us a little bit more on how understanding dispels fear and the yeah. connections between learning healing and trauma yeah so I, I think uh, something that's important that that I've kind of come to realize, and and I like to I like to think of myself as a I don't know uh, a philosopher of such. I, I think that uh, fear comes, and out of fear, power and control. Uh, so if I'm afraid of something, I'm going to do what I can to control my environment. And, and you know, I I think in when I was in combat, uh, I was afraid. Um, you know, there were bombs exploding around me. Uh, people were shooting at me. There was always this intense thought that today might be my last day. And, and fear can take hold. And so, and so uh, <laughs> most soldiers, most Marines, airmen, sailors, uh, they're going to tell you straight up if you ask them, were you afraid? Hell yes, I was afraid. I was afraid all the time. And, and what you do out of that fear is you move to control. And, and I feel like uh, that's what we do. Um, we fear things we don't know, so then we try to control them. You know, if, I, think, I think really, if you look at power dynamics in even our own country, uh, out of fear, we try to control those that we do not know anything about. I, I, <laughs> It's because we're afraid somehow. What if we what if we change that and we learn something about the people that are around us? I was afraid of everything that had anything to do with Islam. Uh, you know, if I'll just be honest, when when uh, when I came to um, Tempe, it was the first time I had seen a mosque that. I didn't remember getting shot at from right. So like, there's this this thing. I was afraid even to walk by there. Until, guess what? I learned about some people that were inside of it. 
and I actually had some conversations. And I can remember vividly actually standing on the curb outside of the mosque here in Tempe and the step that I took off the curb onto the yard of the mosque, I, I felt like, I feel like Neil Armstrong in a moment. Like I was taking this giant leap for mankind, Sean kind. And uh, I went up there, I knocked on the door, I got greeted, uh, I got invited in for coffee. We had a great conversation. Uh, and, and can I tell you how that dispelled the fear in me? And then it, I, I, I could put down my, my defenses some. I didn't have to control the situation. And no longer do I have that. And, and I think that, you know, if people are just being honest, their phobias, uh, <laughs> and it's because a lot of times they don't know anything about it. They don't because they have chosen to control that part of their life to not even learn. Um, and, and I guess that's, that's kind of how I see it less. I mean, I could go on and on about it, but uh, yeah. I think it's one of the great things about working at a university or mm -hmm. being in the military is um, being exposed to people that are different from you, people yeah. who previously you might have thought were so different from you that you could not, you didn't have anything in common. Right. Um, yeah. That was my that was my case being being put onto an aircraft carrier with six thousand people um, mm -hmm. from really different backgrounds. Yeah. And and I think it's true at a university. I think so. Um, too. It's one of the glorious things about working at a place like ASU is the, the people. That you, you can meet. even like an army guy and I can like <laughs> an idiot. Let's not take it too far. Uh, <laughs> so what resources uh, slash support do you recommend for spouses and others who are trying their best to help a loved one through trauma? Mm. Yeah. So resources, uh, listen, if, if you're if you're connected to ASU, and you have uh, you have somebody who you love that's in the military, then please reach out to us at the Pat Toma Veterans Center. I mean, first things first. If you're if you're connected to us, um, we have people like myself and and Benno and Sonia and and all the other staff members we have at the Pat Toma Veterans Center. We are a great we are a great resource. Um, another resource I wanted to say is uh, ASU Counseling Services. Um, if you're connected to ASU. Uh, look into that. Like it's a service that's already guaranteed to you. And it, and I can tell you a lot of times I reach to the edge of what I can help you with. And I guess what I'll refer you to people who are, have their PhDs in things that can help you. Um, one, one thing I want to just encourage you, if you're, if you're a loved one and your loved one has PTSD been struggling with depression, anxiety, now is the time to help. Uh, I guess if you could just listen to me for a second. Now is the time to help. Uh, even if they get upset at you for helping them, do it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm on this journey, Wes, we talked about it a little bit. The book is all part of that, part of the puzzle. I want to stop veteran suicide. 22 veterans a day take their own life. But can I tell you? That's closely followed by the LGBTQ community, teenage kids committing suicide. Um, this, this country is kind of full of trauma. And, it, and if you love someone, do something about it. Help them seek the help that they need. Uh, I know that we'll put, we'll put some uh, resources hopefully here. There's a suicide hotline. There's just different, if you're a veteran, go to the VA. I know it can seem a little frustrating. I know it's like, oh, all I hear is bad stuff. Can I tell you, go to the VA. They do care about you. There's a whole group of people that work there because they love veterans. They love veterans' families. Um, here in Arizona, you could go to the Arizona Department of Veteran Services. My good friend Wanda Wright is the, is the director over there. She, she served like 32 years in the Air Force she loves her fellow veterans. We, there's so many people, the veteran service officers, uh, even here at the Pat Toma Veteran Center, we have a VA uh, employee, Troy Rundle, who loves veterans and he wants to help and that's why he has his job. Trust me, there are resources beyond resources and don't feel like you're alone because you're not. So yeah, there you go, Wes. I think you made just now and you made the point in your book, you're saying now is the time if you're the person helping that person who has come to that point in their life 
um, you don't wait to get their permission or to make sure that it's not going to hurt their feelings or it might damage your relationship. If that person needs help, then you need to put them in touch with the help. That's it. You know, can I, can I tell you a quick, a quick story, uh, Wes? And, and this one I'm, I'm going to hold on to for a little while. I uh, was meeting with a, an organization called uh, Shield and Stripes and Shield or Shields and Stripes. And, they, and that's, that's what they do is they, they try a holistic method to help uh, veterans get through uh, post-traumatic stress. Uh, it's just so holistic health and exercise. And it's just a great organization. And this guy, he was telling me a story about one of our former Sun Devil veterans who had recently taken his own life. And uh, recently, meaning like in March, I did not know that this had occurred. And so I started looking into it. And sure enough, they had graduated recently, 4.0. Uh, they had actually been a part of one of our programs uh, here at the center. And it was... Uh, this program for, for healing for PTSD. And I realized that maybe there's a chance that I failed them because they came to the program that we held for them because they needed it. I didn't do as much follow-up as I should have done. The time that that person came should have been the time I stepped in and said, you know what? I, they came to this for a reason. Um, so if, if the person is coming to you, it's for a reason. That's what I'm telling you. It's for a reason that they've worked up the courage in that moment to tell you where they're at. Yeah. Don't take time. Do it. Do it. It's, it's important. They're kind of counting on us. So, yeah. They've displayed some courage. So now it's time for you to display some courage, right? Yeah, absolutely. You can be strong. So tell us, um, What's different or special about working at the Pat Tillman Center? Oh, boy. I, you know, I, I told you a little bit already. Uh, you, you have this whole group uh, of individuals that are connected somehow to the military. So we have Army veterans and Marine veterans and, and Air Force veterans and Navy veterans. And I don't think there's any Coast Guard right now because that's like a unicorn when you find one of those. But I <laughs> like Air Force veterans, everybody has like come together into this space that we call the Pat Tillman Veterans Center. We all believe in, in the vision and the mission of helping student veterans succeed. And, and I know that that's not different than every other department. And I know every department wants students to succeed. What's different and special is that probably 90 Eight percent of every student that comes in the Pat Tillman Veterans Center is a non-traditional non-traditional student. Uh, you know what a lot of people don't know is that the average age of a student veteran is 31 here at ASU. Uh, they've had a career of some sort before they came to school, so they're a completely non-traditional demographic. And and what's special is that we get to see them in that light because we live that. We know that. And, uh, and the, other, the other part is, is that it's a camaraderie to work at the Pat Tillman Veterans Center, one that every one of us that come to work there had missed. So I ask every, almost every student veteran I come in contact with, what's the one thing you miss from the military times? And they say that the camaraderie, that closeness and that bond that we have with our brothers and sisters. And that's something about the Pat Tillman Veterans Center that maybe is super special to me. Um, they're like family. Um, I have a family, obviously. I got kids and grandkids and, and I love them. I got a beautiful, wonderful wife. Um, but there was something that I needed when I left the army that I found in the Pat Tillman Veterans Center. And, and that's super special to me. Yeah. If you were to update your work with another L, so a sixth L, yeah. what would it be? Where would it go? <clears throat> Uh, it go at, it go at the end, and the L would be let it go. Uh, so so here's the deal with somebody who's who's lived with trauma. So I've I've had trauma when I was a kid. Uh, trauma in my you know teens, 
trauma in my 20s, trauma at war. What we do, and you, you may have said, you know, I, I quoted this in my book, but the body keeps the score. So we're always carrying these traumas. Uh, I always look, you know, it isn't even, Wes, just the, the traumas that we hold on to. Um, so if I'm empathetic and I care about you and you come and you share your trauma with me, guess what I've just added? I've added your trauma to my trauma. And so it just kind of becomes this weight and it can kind of squish a person down. And I feel like there has to be this, I use this all the time, uh, imagine yourself as a rice cooker. If in that rice cooker, there wasn't just that little opening that lets some steam out, you would eventually become an improvised explosive device. You would explode if you didn't let it go. And, and, and uh, people are like, well, how do you let it go? And there's a lot of different ways for a lot of different people. But I like to think if we can move to a place of compassion, then we can let off some steam. So if I empathize with you about all your trauma, um, and let's say you start to cry, Wes, the compassionate thing for me to do is to cry with you. And guess what I've done at that moment? I've let it go with you. We have to do that. So I think if I had another L, it'd be like, okay, you've been traumatized and you've worked through all these things. It's time to let it go. Uh, you can't, you can't forget it. I'm never going to forget war. I'm, I'm always going to be post-war Sean. I was pre-war Sean and post-war Sean. Can't change that. That's the facts. But I can let some of that stuff go. I can quit carrying around my survivor's guilt, let's say. Because my good buddy, Dennis, who uh, uh, got, got exploded in Iraq and, and I missed the IED and then he was had a traumatic brain injury and all of these things that went on. I carried all of that for the last 13 years, right? And I have to tell myself, Sean, you can let some of that stuff go, you know? I think it's important. So let it go, let it go. I have one more prepared question for you, and then we're gonna to go to audience questions. So audience, if you have questions, please put them into chat and um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll see them in a second. Um, but Sean, the, the last three words of the book are, change begins today. What would you like this audience to know as they leave the event and go on about their daily activities? I believe that if you can practice conscious love, um, so it's actually in the forefront of your mind, uh, then you can begin to change your life. So I, I think I said it in, in the CISA convocation that I spoke at, uh, <clears throat> consciously love those close to you and those who wander by. If we can begin to practice that, I think our lives get better personally. And I think the people that we come in contact with, it starts today. I mean, when you go out on the road, when you're leaving work today, instead of honking and flipping somebody off, consciously think, what happened to that person that they cut me off? Maybe they had a really bad day. They're, they got fired or Maybe they're a veteran who just got stuck in the moment right there thinking about getting shot down, right? What if, what if we thought that way and we consciously decided to love? I think that changes a lot of different things. So, yeah. Okay. So we do have um, some questions here. Um, Rick would like to know, when's your next book coming out? <laughs> <laughs> well, Rick, I'm, I'm, I've actually started the manuscript for... Uh, for my next book. It's called uh, The Return of the Five L's, Practically Loving You. And so I think that there's a, a lot to be said about trauma and uh, that we lose that love and feeling for ourselves. And I think if we turn the five L's back on ourselves, we can learn once again to love ourselves. And so that's coming out. I'm going to hope I'm, I'm finishing up my master's. I graduate in December. I'm doing this whole staff council president thing. So I'm, I'm hoping actually in 2024 uh, for that. And then I'm also working with a, a good friend, also veteran on a cookbook. Uh, 
and uh, we're hoping that the monthly familia will get published here in a year or two as well. It's about bringing cultures together around food. And uh, we're hoping to publish that too. So I, I can't give you it right away, but I'm hoping that it happens. <laughs> um, Benno, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, uh, ask Sean, how can we talk about love in a professional environment? <laughs> Where's the line in your eyes? How can we make, how can love make our workplaces more compatible with human happiness? Yeah. Yeah, I know uh, people start to kind of move around in their seats a little bit when you start talking about love. And, and again, I think it's because we put love existential. It's like out here. It's this thing. But if we actually in our actions in our, Benno, thanks for the question. The actions in our professional lives can translate love without having to even talk about it. So it's that trauma-informed lens that looking at the people that you supervise, it's, uh, uh, it's like looking at somebody and knowing what, what makes them happy, right? You work with them and let's say you know that you're a quality time person and time is important to you. As a supervisor, I should say, well, a big massive raise isn't gonna make Benno happy, but being able to, to peel out a half hour early today is gonna to be something that, that I can do that shows love to him. And, and I think we all have that opportunity uh, as we work on a day to day. Uh, what if you know that your colleague loves a certain particular donut? You've seen them eat it 17 times and they bring it in every time. What if one day you just show up with that donut? Uh, it's it's practical. The name. I, I want to work with you, Sean. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do what we can, Wes. What's your favorite donut, brother? Oh, the uh, sour cream. Oh, sour cream. Definitely. Yeah. All right. Um, we one. have just a couple minutes left here. Um, Michelle has a question. In chapter three, you advocate for learning about trauma. What resources do you recommend for becoming more trauma informed, not specifically for military veterans, but for the general population? Oh boy, <laughs> that question is intense. There are there are so many there are so many uh, places to learn more about being trauma informed. I just saw, in fact, I think uh, Abero, you're on here. If you're still on here, what was the LinkedIn? Uh, the LinkedIn course that you just finished about being a trauma-informed leader. Like uh, just, just Google how to become more trauma-informed and guess what? You're going to learn tons about it. In fact, Arizona is one of those trauma-informed uh, states. Thank you, Adaro. Uh, one of those trauma-informed states. Uh, the governor has, has worked with the different organizations around Arizona to, to help schools become more trauma-informed. Um, if you've ever watched the movie, The Paper the Paper Tigers, check that movie out. It talks about the ACEs and having a high school that is actually about adverse childhood experiences. They actually teach according to the ACE scores. And I, I, I'm telling you, it's a brilliant movie and it's, it's heart-wrenching. Uh, I'd start there if you wanna really get a taste that's where I started. I watched that movie and it, and it kind of changed the, the course for me. Thanks, Mary. It's Paces. Yes. I would add to check with your <laughs> ASU librarians too. <laughs> if, you're from, if you're with ASU, they might know check with thing. your, check with your, check with your librarians about resources. They might know the library thing, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that we have just kind of run out of time um, at this point. Um, and so I'm going to uh, turn it back over to our, our hosts here. But thanks, Sean. It's been great talking to you. Thanks, Wes. I appreciate you, man. Thank you. That was uh, really enlightening. Uh, at ASU Library, I would like to extend a big thank you to Sean Bonzoff and Wes Edens for bringing their energy, enthusiasm, and expertise to today's event. We would also like to thank all of you for attending today. Today's event has been recorded and will, will be available on the ASU Library's YouTube channel. You will receive a post-event survey. We would appreciate it if you would take a couple minutes to share your thoughts with us. Um, thank you all. Thank you for your presence. Have a good evening.